So I got a chance to meet Molly Day and Carlos in Provincetown that first night last Labor Day. And then we headed the next day to Nantucket. Nantucket, an historic island, the Quaker Island. It's where Frederick Douglass gave his first address against slavery. He trembled when he spoke. His body shook because he was speaking from his own experience. Frederick Douglass had been enslaved as a child and a youth born on the eastern shore of Maryland. Uh, he had been handed over to a slave breaker named Ed Covey. Uh, the slave owners gave their troublesome slaves to Covey. And he would break them, he would beat them. But Frederick Douglass fought back, broke away, headed north, changed the world. Edward Covey's property on the eastern shore of Maryland and St. Michael's called Mount Misery. Mount Misery today owned by Donald Rumsfeld. He bought it in 2003. It's his vacation home. To be down the road from his close friend, Vice President Dick Cheney. Now, I have told the story hundreds of times. It's rather amazing, to say the least. And I started to wonder, is it true? Is this just urban myth? Though I had read about it, I had researched it. So I decided to go and see with my own eyes. So I went to St. Michael. Um, we drove up. We first saw an organic coffee shop. And we said, OK, we'll stop in there. There's where we'll get the truth. <laughs> and we said, does Donald Rumsfeld live near here? They said, you just go down the road. You make a left, and you make a right, head down. And that's where he lives, at the end of the road. And so we drove. We drove down the road, and right ahead of us was Mount Pleasant Road. We knew that was not the right direction. And so we took a left, and parallel to that road, Mount Misery Road. We made a right, and we started driving. And we saw at the end of it, yes, we were coming to our destination. The Secret Service was there in their gas-guzzling SUV. Um, and so I got out, and I started to film. And in case you think this might not be known what this place is, make no mistake about it, there on the other side of the driveway was a stake in the ground, a plaque, Mount Misery. We had arrived. Just down the road was an old black church. It was Sunday morning, so we headed over. And the parishioners were having Sunday school before Mass. And I started to talk to them, some of the older people. And I asked if they knew about this whole history and what they thought of here was where Frederick Douglass was enslaved and the plantation, Mount Misery, and Donald Rumsfeld. And one of the older women said to me, I can't comment right now. I'm in church. <laughs> Mount Misery torture. How is it that we have come to be known for torture around the world? That we represent torture. If you think about how we see ourselves, maybe the most famous, the iconic image coming out of the invasion was the statue of Saddam Hussein going down, because we saw it so many times, thousands of times. Everyone remembers that statue going down, right, with the rope around his neck in Fierdo Square, just outside the frame where the US Marines pulling it down. And you heard it was a popular uprising that pulled it down. But still, statue of Saddam Hussein going down hundreds, thousands of times, because we saw it so much on every single network. If you ask people outside this country, the most famous image, iconic image of the war and occupation invasion, I dare say it would be an Iraqi prisoner standing on a box bag over his head, arms out, electrodes dangling from his fingertips. How has that come to represent us? At Abu Ghraib, at Bagram, at Guantanamo, at the black sites we don't even know about. We recently did a piece on an Ethiopian prison. I mean, a prison in Ethiopia that the CIA is involved with. And I was horrified right afterwards. A young man from New Jersey was being held there. He has recently uh, been released. Uh, we interviewed an AP reporter named Anthony Mitchell, who had done the expose. 
You know, these um, wire reporters like Reuters and AP, you think, well, if you do it, everyone else is doing because these go to the newsrooms all over the world. This, and if you get Reuters footage, for example, you're going to look like everyone else. Hardly, hardly. Most of this stuff that gets out, most of these images, rarely seen in this country. And then when you're on the inside and you're seeing the footage, you see how deliberate it is, how conscious they have to deliberately stop those images from getting out because they have all the access that the rest of the world does to those images. It's truly amazing. I mean, you know, the Wall Street Journal did a piece. I, has Rupert Murdoch bought it yet? I'm not sure because I hadn't checked the news this morning. But, you know, he's in conversation with the Bancroft family as the media consolidation continues from television to radio to newspapers. But the Wall Street Journal did an interesting piece looking at CNN, that one network which actually owns two networks, CNN International and CNN Domestic. CNN International uh, and Domestic, the day that the statue went down, we saw thousands of times the statue going down on CNN Domestic. CNN International knew they couldn't get away with that because they were broadcasting to the rest of the world and they were competing with the other networks that were showing the images of war. So they did a split screen. And on one side, they showed the statue going down over and over, but on the other side, they showed the casualties of war. We would not be in the fifth year of this war if we saw that in this country on a regular basis. I, I often compare it to, look what happened with Hurricane Katrina that bookended President Bush's longest vacation in presidential history, right? Cindy Sheehan begins it and Hurricane Katrina ends it. And here, President Bush doesn't respond, make no mistake about it. He was fully briefed by video conference, told this could be the big one, Hurricane Katrina. This could be the one that wipes out an American city as he is sitting in Crawford. He learns this. What does he do? You know, you can't be sure. That's the nature of global warming. Dare we put those two words together that are vacuumed off government websites. But global warming, extreme weather, you can't be sure for sure. But what is the nature of leadership? You prepare for the worst and you hope for the best. Did President Bush head off to Washington race to be near um, the target area? No. He raced to California and there he was photographed uh, with a country music star whose signature song was Wish You Were Here. Could have been the theme song of the people of New Orleans. Um, and then he went back to Crawford and there the levees broke, the hurricane hit and it wasn't just Bush. Cheney was fly fishing in Wyoming. We're talking Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, Condoleezza Rice in my city, New York. She's taking in spam a lot. She plays tennis with Monica Sellis. She goes to Ferragamo, the high-end shoe shop and a customer there says, what are you doing here when people are dying in New Orleans and they take her out? The customer that is. Um, Andrew Card, then chief of staff, um, is vacationing somewhere in New England, the former GM lobbyist, right? You know Andrew Card, who just was given an honorary degree by the University of Massachusetts Amherst, his alma mater. Quite astounding to see. I encourage you to go to our website, democracynow.org. You can see the video of the graduation. It looked like the entire place of thousands was in tumult, uh, wearing those on their... Um, Mortarboard, what do you call those mortarboards? Um, well, that's similar to war, but on those mortarboards, um, it would say card with the band sign. Professors, students, faculty, staff, it was amazing with the faculty holding up a banner behind it, him. <laughs> no to card and yes to the students. Um, it is, so you have the Bush administration. The GM lobbyist, Andrew Card, Condoleezza Rice sat on the board of Chevron for more than a decade. Vice President Cheney, former head of the largest oil services corporation in the world, Halliburton Bush, a failed oil man himself. <laughs> You've got the ascendancy of the oligarchy in Washington. <laughs> is it any surprise that their thirst for oil is determining foreign policy from Iraq to Iran to Venezuela? But you can stop it. People see. People see because there is an independent media that is growing all over this country and around the world. 
And we have to start with the images. And when it came to Katrina, while the Bush administration didn't go there, the corporate media did. And they did the right thing. You just show up. And they were showing the horror. They were showing the people drowning. And what was the, one of the first things the Bush administration did? They said, you're not to show the bodies. You know, that executive order and the soldiers coming home. Same thing. You are not to show the bodies, to which the editor of the Times-Picayune commented, you have got to be kidding. <laughs> and I remember seeing this young woman reporter, TV reporter, in the water. A man, come, uh, man comes up holding his boy's hand. He's clearly in shock. He said he was just holding his wife's hand. And as it slipped out of his, she said, take care of the children. And he turned around and walked off in shock into the water. And this young reporter starts to cry. That's reporting from the victim's perspective. Key. See, because when these reporters went to New Orleans, as they should have, a side effect of the Bush administration not responding was that there were no troops to embed with. And so we were seeing news from the victim's perspective, unspun, unfiltered, even in the corporate media. And it galvanized this country. People across the political spectrum, it didn't matter. It was humanity responding to humanity. Could you imagine if for one week in Iraq we saw these images? We saw the soldiers dead and dying. We saw the babies dead on the ground. We saw the women with their legs blown off by cluster bombs from Iraq to Lebanon. If we saw these images for one week, Americans are a compassionate people. They would say, no, war is not the answer to conflict in the 21st century. That is the power of an independent media, because the media are the most powerful institutions on Earth, more powerful than any bomb, more powerful than any missile. And the Pentagon's deployed the media, and we have to take it back. The stakes are no less than the fate of the Earth. That is what we have come to. And that is what people, I think, recognize. That is why we are arriving at a moment where it doesn't matter if you're a conservative Republican or a progressive, a Democrat, an independent, a Green, a socialist, that people are agreeing from top to bottom as well, from the high-level generals to the low-level soldiers. It really does matter that this is a turning point right now. And that part of the book where we talk about static, covering the movements that create static and make history, going back in time since we're in Chicago, the people who have dared to show what's going on. You know, there was just this Klan trial, and after many decades, uh, uh, the Klansman seal was just convicted for the murder of two young men, 19-year-olds, um, whose bodies were found only because everyone was looking for the three civil rights workers, Andrew Goodman, Mickey Schwerner, and James Cheney, who'd been killed. And they kept turning up other black bodies and two of those bodies. That has just been solved today. Go back now. Here we are in Chicago. Go back to 1955 to a young man named Emmett Till, 14 years old. Not a young man. He's a boy. And his mother, Mamie, sent him down to Money, Mississippi to be with his family for the summer. And he was killed. He was lynched. He was um, uh, brutalized by these, well, it looks like, though it hasn't been fully investigated to this day, two uh, brothers uh, who said he wolf whistled at a white woman. And he ends up in the bottom of the Tallahatchie River. And Mamie Till, Mamie Till Mobley, here in Chicago, engages like Nadja in a revolutionary act. When her boy's casket was sent up, she said, I want that casket open for the funeral. This is back in 1955. And thousands of people streamed by that casket and saw that face bloated five, ten times the size it should be brutalized. And she wanted the world to see the ravages of racism, the brutality of bigotry. Thousands did, and then Jet Magazine and other black publications published the photographs, and they were seared into the history and memory and conscience of this country. Mamie Till Mobley had something very important to teach the press of today. Show the pictures. Show the images. That is our job, to go to where the silence is. And when it comes to issues like torture, it is our job 
to shine that light in these dark places, what they call the black sites, the prisons we don't know about, that Anthony Mitchell exposed, though just recently died in the Kenyan Airways crash over Cameroon with so many other Africans. Anthony Mitchell, a really great AP reporter who exposed this Ethiopian prison. We've got to show what's going on at Bagram, at Guantanamo, continue as the fourth suicide just happened. This fourth suicide is of a Saudi soldier, a Saudi soldier who was trained by the United States. He was there for how many years? Who else is there? Sami al, Sami al Haj, the Al Jazeera reporter who has been at Guantanamo for more than five years. You know what, what we recently heard from him? We did get one word out from Guantanamo. He said, free Alan Johnson. That's what he said. He said, imprisoning reporters is not the answer. But how does this happen? Who engages, who engages in the torture? Last week, my column was on a hypocritical oath, psychologists and torture. Maybe you saw the Democracy Now! broadcast two weeks ago, the exclusive we had with some of the psychologists who are making the decision around what stance the APA will take. It is truly astounding. First, do no harm. That tenet of medicine applies equally to psychologists, yet they're increasingly implicated in abusive interrogations, dare we say torture, at US military detention facilities like Guantanamo. Well, the American Medical Association and the American Psychiatric Association both have passed resolutions prohibiting members from participating in interrogations. The American Psychological Association, the most liberal of these groups of almost 150,000 members, refuses to pass such a resolution despite the outrage of many of its members. Now, with the declassification of a report by the Pentagon's Inspector General detailing psychologists' role in military interrogations, the Senate Committee on Armed Services has announced it's going to investigate. Dr. Leonard Rubenstein, Executive Director of Physicians for Human Rights, says such an investigation into the development of torture techniques by the United States would be very significant. It should get into the use of psychologists and the development of the techniques, what is happening now, and how this can be avoided in the future. Two years ago, after a leaked report from the International Committee of the Red Cross criticized the role of health professionals in US interrogations, the American Psychological Association formed a presidential task force called PENS, Psychological Ethics and National Security. There were nine voting members. Six of them were tied to the military. At the time, the identity of the panelists were secret. The Penn's panel endorsed the continued participation of psychologists in military interrogations. So now the Pentagon does not turn to the American Medical Association or the American Psychiatric Association because they have said no. They turn to the psychologists for validation and for continuation of the interrogations. So there were six military, three non-military. Of the three non-military voting members, one, Dr. Michael Wessels of Randolph-Macon College resigned. Another, who we interviewed last week, Dr. Jean Maria Rigo, recently called for the Penn's report to be annulled. She called for it on Democracy Now! Um, she said, I'm an oral historian, maybe even before a psychologist, and I always take notes, and I was told very sharply by one of the military psychologists at the two-day meeting not to take notes. She took them anyway. She archived the group's entire email listserv, including months of emails from before and after the sole two-day pens meeting. She went on, I came later to realize the entire report had been orchestrated. I no longer felt bound by that confidentiality agreement. They said you couldn't talk about it. She wasn't allowed to take notes, but one of the military guys took notes through the whole day and said by the end of the first day of two days, they had basically, he had basically written the report to her horror. They thought they were beginning to have a discussion about what should happen, and the report had already been written. 
She recently handed over all her materials to the Senate Armed Services Committee. The third psychologist, who was not military, Dr. Nina Thomas, told me, I don't think I was in fact critically aware of what Morgan Banks' role was at the time of the meetings themselves. I knew his background. I didn't know the meaning of his background. Colonel Morgan Banks. Yes, one of the six military psychologists who were making this decision, the recommendation to the APA on what should do. Mark Benjamin, you should read his stuff at Salon.com. Very good stuff on soldiers and what's happening to the military. Um, first reported that Colonel Morgan Banks is the uh, Siri psychologist. That's Army survival, evasion, resistance, and escape psychologist responsible for the training and oversight of all Army Siri psychologists. Um, he provides technical support and consultation to all psychologists providing interrogation support. Another task force member, Captain Bryce Lefevre, served as the Navy Siri School from 90 to 93, then became the Special Forces Task Force Psychologist to Afghanistan in 2002. Also included our Scott Shoemate, who was the Chief Operational Psychologist for the CIA's Counterterrorism Center in 2003. He then became head of the Pentagon Counterintelligence Field Activities Behavioral Sciences Director at Overseeing Psychology participation in the interrogation process at Guantanamo. These non-military psychologists on the nine-member panel had no idea who these other six people were, the level of involvement in the interrogations themselves. They thought it was a group of people who were really objectively looking at what the role of psychologists were. And this Siri program is one to be investigated. Includes sensory and sleep deprivation, isolation, cultural and sexual humiliation, stress positions like forced standing, extended subjection to light, loud noise, extremes of heat and cold, waterboarding, wherein subjects had their face covered with a cloth that then was poured over it, giving the feeling of suffocation. The goal of Siri is to train US military members to resist torture they might experience if captured. But as first reported by Jane Mayer of the New Yorker magazine, the Siri techniques were reversed engineered. In other words, they were used against the prisoners. The upcoming APA annual convention is taking place August 17th to 20th in San Francisco. Yes, it will be hotly contested. An unknown number of members are withholding their dues. A number have quit. Physicians for Human Rights summed it up. They said, we're talking about ending complicity and torture by a profession that has an enormous amount to contribute to the good of humanity and should not be involved in the destruction of people. A major decision. This is a very serious issue that must be contended with, and I also call for an investigation in the higher levels of the American Psychological Association of their links to military and intelligence in this country. That has to be done for the very good tens of thousands of psychologists who are deeply committed to helping people, not destroying them. Um, I'll just wrap up by saying I think the only hope, the only answer, is the level of resistance that you engage in now. I think around this country, people are in agreement. I mean, Bush has managed to do something very important. He has united people across the political spectrum against him. And, but, it is not just President Bush or the Bush administration. When you look at the change in power in Congress, the Democrats now in office continuing to fund war, it is clearly not going to come from the top down. But that's what I think people understood everywhere in this country who have been involved in activism. It comes from people at every level of society just recognizing in their daily lives that this so-called war on terror, perhaps more accurately called the war of terror, is not making us safer. No matter what you feel politically, we are in a much more dangerous position now as viewed by people around the world. Because I think Americans have prided themselves for a very long time on being a model of behavior. But if we torture people, if we engage in that extraordinary term, extraordinary rendition, which is White House for kidnapping, 
Now several dozen CIA agents are in trial in Italy for cat kidnapping a Muslim sheikh off the streets of Milan in absentia. The US won't turn them over. Uh, Maher Arar has become one of the most famous men in Canada. He was simply a Canadian citizen making his way through JFK, picked up by US authorities in September 2002, sent off to Syria, and for 10 months he was interrogated. He was brutalized, and then he was, as inexplicably as he was taken, released to Canada, a broken man. A big investigation done by a Canadian Judicial Commission comes out with a many hundred page report saying he is a completely innocent man, criticizing, condemning the Bush administration. Stephen Harper, a close Bush ally, conservative Christian, conservative Canadian prime minister holding a news conference, castigating the Bush administration for what they've done, awarding Maher Arar $10 million, now named as one of the hundred most um, uh, significant uh, people in the world by Time magazine, yet hardly known in this country. What do we want to represent? What do we want to model? Because if this is what we represent, torture and kidnapping, what will happen if a US citizen, a US soldier, a US dignitary, a diplomat is captured somewhere in the world and his captors say, we'll do it the American way? No, we are better than that. I think the America that we are building is about valuing dissent and discussion and debate and the place to do that, the most powerful, most effective place to do that is in the media, which is why we have to fight for a free and independent media. I see the media as a huge kitchen table that stretches not only across this country that, but across the globe that we all sit around and debate and discuss the most important issues of the day, life and death, war and peace, and anything less than that is a disservice to the service men and women of this country who can't have these debates on military bases. They rely on us in civilian society to have these debates about whether to send them, whether they will go to fight or to die. Yes, anything less than that is a disservice to a democratic society. Democracy Now. Um, there are two things that are important to know about Amy Goodman that I know that you don't know. It's important for the book signing line, which is going to happen over here. The first is that Amy Goodman is a doctor. I know you didn't know that. She just received an honorary doctorate from the College of Staten Island. Uh, Staten, yeah, Staten Island College. So she's, she's a doctor. The second thing that you don't know about Amy Goodman that's also important is she's Irish. I know, you think that she's actually from Long Island, but, but she's not, she's Irish, which is why Amy asked me to announce that today, June 16th, is Bloom's Day. Those of you who read James Joyce's Ulysses, you know that today is Leopold Bloom's Day in the streets of Dublin, so Amy's asked me to make that announcement today. So